I loved school. Um, so I pretty much dabbled in everything. I love the arts, I love science, I love math. I kind of just took a lot of joy from everything. And even now, even now, it's, I think there's something wrong with me because I could keep wanting to learn. I would love to go back to school. But um, so even last year, I took up the drums. Um, I learned a songwriting course. I did a songwriting course and stuff. So I'm always, I always enjoy people teaching me stuff. Um, I suppose one thing I didn't like so much was exams and tests. Um, but I enjoyed the process of learning. And eventually when I reconciled that exams and tests were just a way to celebrate what you've learned, I got okay with it, but I still get the nerves. Whenever someone tells me they're doing an exam, I definitely have the nerves on their behalf. Um, so yeah, I couldn't pick one subject, but um, I just love school. I mean, I'm not a teacher, so I'm not sure of you know proper terminology but I feel like teachers that inspired me the most were teachers that let me guide my own teaching in a way so you know if we were learning about I don't know climate change or pollution or something like that a teacher that would allow us to go off and explore that in the ways we wanted to probably ha held my attention better than someone who just told me the facts I definitely appreciated more hands-on learning than sort of book learning, I suppose. Um, and the more practical elements of that, I suppose that, but it, it doesn't really lend itself to all types of subjects. I get, yeah, I, I don't really know. I think it, it really came down to teachers. So my experience in the UK, despite the fact living, that I lived in London was that we lived in an area that was predominantly white and um, I felt, I, I probably felt a bit like I was on the outside despite being born in the UK and the same sort of, um, you know, cultural references and things as any other, you know, white British student would have had. It, I kind of felt like I was on the outside and it was only once they got to university that I felt like I found a group of people because they were a diverse group. Um, and it was a, you know, a mixing pot of different people at the university with me. And um, I feel like in surrounding yourself with different cultures and different um, ideas and values, not only do you learn, you also get to challenge your own opinions, you know, make sure the way you view the world is how you want to view the world, you know, and, and, and it's not just about diversity of culture, it's also about, you know, ableism and all these sorts of things, you know, you want to question um, whether the way you were brought up and the ideas you've held fast are really what you want to hang on to. So I think that is a good thing. It, ask, it makes you ask questions. Um, and the world is getting so small because of the internet. I think it's so important that we know more about each other um, and we learn from each other because, you know, that's what makes the world exciting. Our differences make, make the world exciting, but at the heart of it, we're all still part of the same humanity. So we, you know, we all have that in common. So, um, yeah, I personally, for me, the diversity is what made me feel like I found my group. Um, and I didn't feel like an outsider anymore. So that was important to me. I think the thing is, if you come, if you get down to the nitty gritty, you'll find you have more in common than you have differences. However, the differences are what adds that kind of variety of life, it adds that, you know, uniqueness and it helps you see it in a different way. Even if you talk to children, the way they see the world is so different from the way adults see the world. I think it's just fascinating that they, interpret things in the way they do so yeah sure the more diverse the better i say i definitely prefer a hard copy of a book um for me the reading experience isn't just about the story it's the either it includes the feel of the book the look of the cover um the turning of the pages the smell of the book you know it's a whole feeling for me when i'm reading a book and um Unfortunately, all the books I want to read would not fit um, on my shelf. So I do read stuff online. I do read digital versions of books, especially if I um, want to read something quickly because it takes 
about a million years for anything to arrive in New Zealand. So um, if I want to desperately read something quickly, I will have to get a sort of Kindle version or something like that to read. Um, I also love audiobooks. I love being read to. It's one of my favourite things. Um, as a family, we have a family book. So we, every night we read together. Probably I have skewed <laughs> his liking for reading, probably. Um, when I was a kid, um, my mum, she, she probably hate me for saying this, um, she used to drop us off at the library and the library was like our baby sister and me and my sisters would be at the library reading all day long on a Saturday and then taking home like heaps of books and um, she would go out and do the shopping and stuff like that knowing that we were in a safe place <laughs> with each other <laughs> surrounded by books um, so I think it was instilled in us and I did not I didn't have a literary I didn't have parents in the literary circle or anything like that so they actually came quite a sciencey background. So um, yeah, I think reading was always an escape for me and my sisters. And so I wanted to share that with Phoenix as well. I do strongly believe that reading and books can open up the world to kids. So I would have tried to find other ways to get him to enjoy reading and reading books. I mean, there was definitely a period in, in his life where he only wanted to read picture books for pleasure. And I knew he was reading other stuff at school. So I was like, that's fine. You know, I don't care if you're seven, eight, nine and you're wanting to read picture books, go for it. Bring 30 home from the library, that's perfect. Um, and so I didn't push what choices really were there, but now he's a really competent reader. I will say, oh, you should try this book. Oh, this book's gonna be great for you, that kind of thing. I think it's okay to say there are more books in the world that any one person can ever read in a lifetime. So it's okay to put it down and read something else. The first character that came to mind in Bad Panda, there we go, there's Bad Panda there, it was Lynn. So Lynn um, was the loudest voice. I knew the book would be her voice, her perspective, her wanting to achieve something. I didn't quite know what it was. Um, and then as we, I built the characters around her, um, I realised she needed someone to sort of balance her out a bit. She needed some something to tie her to home. And then when she moved, um, not to give too much away, but when she moved to the zoo, I needed another relationship there to, you know, help her feel grounded. Um, and I, you know, immediately when I think of friendship, I mean, friendship is sort of integral to all my stories, actually. But um, when I think of friendship, I always immediately go to my sisters. They're, they're, we had a really close friendship as children. And though we sort of drifted a little bit um, as adults, we still maintained a close friendship. We talk every day um, and, you know, they're my best friends because not only are they my sisters and friends, we've been through the same experiences, which is a bond you can't you know, really established with anyone else other than a sibling. So I knew it was going to be some sort of sibling relationship. When I'm writing the book, I have a rough idea of where the story's gonna go. So I know the characters, I know the setting, I know probably what the characters want to achieve. And I know that I'm gonna have to give them some difficulty along the way and then I know they have to get to the end of the book so I have a rough idea and then I just start writing um, I think if you just start writing you'll run out of steam and <laughs> you will um, write your first chapter and every time you come back to your story you'll go back to your first chapter and it'll be edited beautifully at the end but you'll have nothing else because it's been so exhausting going over the same stuff so you kind of have to split up the work a little bit so that you know on your first writing day you might write chapter one and then you don't look at that again and then you start chapter two and you know kind of what's going to happen in that and then you move on. So I give myself a sort of plan but I allow myself the liberty to change it along the way and know that you know as I write it I get to know my characters better and I know they're going to do something a bit different and you know it's not set in stone. Um, and why, only once I've got the whole thing down will I then go back and play with each chapter and see what I can tweak and change and what's not flowing and what's, what's flowing. Because 
Certainly when I was younger, I would, and, and the teacher said, OK, now you're going to write a story um, in class or something. I would start, and I, I might start with the, the title or something, and I'd be like, oh, this is an exciting title. And I would write that first chapter, and I'd be so excited about it. And then when we got back to writing again, I'd go back over the first chapter and really like make sure, oh yeah, that doesn't work there. And, so, and I'd go back over, the, over and it would keep going. And I'd only have this perfect chapter one and nothing else because I hadn't really planned what might happen. Um, so I think it really helps to have a rough plan, but allow yourself the freedom to stray from it if you need to. I mean, people have different ways of writing. I'm sure there are people who are really brave and just write. <laughs> I don't know these people personally, but I'm sure they're there. Um, but I think if I don't have a plan, I will just keep doing my chapter one and then we'll get nowhere. A lot of times you can, especially for me personally, I have like a little voice that's sort of saying, oh, it's not good enough and it's not, you should just give up and stuff. That's my natural go-to place if I'm struggling with something. So. Since having Phoenix, I have to say my resilience has got better because I know I have to lead by example. Um, so I'd always encourage him to try his hardest. If it comes to a point where he just wants to give up and not do whatever it is anymore, I'll try and get him to see it from a different perspective. So if he was doing a project um, and there was different parts of the project to maybe change it up, do something, maybe start with the end or you know, start with another piece, but not to entirely give up on something. I do think, you know, sometimes in your heart, you know, there are projects you need to give up on, um, especially as an adult. But as, you know, a child, I think just dab just try everything. You'll never, you'll never regret trying something. And you always learn from the experience. You know, if you're writing um, a zombie story and you've really hated it <laughs> by day five, you're hating writing the zombie story, you would have real you won't you might not realise at the time, but you would have learnt something in writing that story that you can then take on to your next story, which might be um, a fantasy story or a magical story or something like that. So um, I think there's always stuff you can take away. Um, one thing that Phoenix and I do at the end of each day is we do our best bit of the day and our worst bit of the day. And I think in doing that, you kind of can see like what bits you struggled with and why you struggled with them so I think if you can reflect on that I think it's a big ask for a child but um, as, as adults we can do that with them so if um, I asked him what the best bit of the day was and he said scoring a goal and the worst bit of the day was he didn't do as well in the math test then we can talk about well what did you do well in the math test were you surprised by that or what would you have liked to do better and can we work on that so i think in looking at what's stopping you from achieving what you want to you might be able to overcome it in the next challenge i don't regret doing a medical degree because actually i learned so much i made some of my best friends at university and i married a doctor I think um, there are two trains of thought here. So I would say, if I'm happy where I am now, I don't regret any of the decisions I've made in the past. But as a child, I um, went to a school um, in high, well, I guess secondary school, high school, which was um, definitely for kids who were doing well at school. And so they either went to Oxford or Cambridge, which were these top universities in the UK, or they went and did medicine or dentistry. And I think in narrowing my choices so early on, I didn't really fully appreciate that there were other things I could have chosen to do. Um, and so because I kind of had an aptitude for science and things like that, I kind of just followed the crowd a bit. I'd say as a child, just try everything. You know, um, if you have opportunities to try everything, do it. You know, it could be stuff like sport that you're not interested in. If you've tried it, at least you've sort of got a sense of what you don't like or you do like. Um, you know, try art. Make make your experience as a child so wide that you have an idea of what you want to do. And then when you sort of come to adulthood and you decide you want to change up your career, that's okay too because there's nothing to say you have to 
stick with this one path you chose when you were 16 years old. That kind of seems nuts when you get to about 38 like I am and think, well, that 16 year old swap, she wasn't, she wasn't the best at making decisions. So how dare she make decisions for me now? Um, I think it's okay to change your mind. And so long as you've tried things and you've gone out there and you've experienced life um, and you've given things a go, that's the most you can do, really. Our, Phoenix is heading off to high school in a couple of years and um, we went to see the high school and they offer these amazing opportunities with, you know, technology and sports and um, art. And I just, I envy him because I wish I had taken advantage of all those things that were offered to me. But because I sort of very streamlined myself from the age of about 12 into science, because I thought that's where I should be going. Um, you know, that's, that's basically what happened. And I'm, I'm not sure I would have made a different decision. But if I had opened myself up to doing some arts and some sports as well, I might have made different decisions, um, which means that I probably would have had a book out maybe a bit earlier. Who knows? <laughs> When I go to events, this is like the most commonly asked question. So I always explain it like this. I'm not sure if it's quite right, but this is how it works for me. So imagine you're walking along and you have a little bag or a little shopping bag or something, and you see something or you smell something or you hear something. You know, it could be someone playing an instrument in their house. It could be you walk past the zoo and you could smell kind of manure or it could be that, you know, someone's serving out free samples of something in the supermarket. You you take that experience and you pop it in your bag and you keep going and that's what you keep doing every single day and then eventually someone says right I'd like you to write a story so you open up your bag and you just randomly pick <laughs> out three things and you put it together that is basically what it is all those experiences all those things you see and feel and smell and hear it's, it's sort of sitting in your brain in this like cauldron just waiting to be mixed up um, and that's where you pull your ideas out. That's why I always say to kids, the most important thing you can do as a writer, apart from reading, um, is to just go out and experience life as much as you can do. Um, and just, you know, it doesn't have to be extravagant trips here and there. It can just be even a walk and paying more attention to the things inside the grass. Or it could be just flipping your foot out of your flip-flops and stamping into the mud and feeling what that feels like. It could be anything like that. It just means paying more attention and being a bit more nosy about the world. That's all you have to do. That's where the ideas come from. I don't really, I'm sure there's an idea tree that people pick ideas off of, but I haven't found it. So I'm going with my shopping bag around the world and <laughs> hoping to stock up on ideas. It doesn't have, like I said, you don't have to go on, you know, really expensive trips anywhere. And to be honest, most of us are in lockdown. <laughs> So you can't really go too far anyway, but just paying more attention to the sounds outside the window, you know, to the smells and the street, you know, things like that, that you'll find ideas come to you and certainly taking in information. So the books you read will help you not only, you know, figure out story ideas, but also figure out your own voice, how you want to sound in your story. The next best thing is to read, read millions of things, everything back at the cereal packet, books, whatever you want, even if you put it down and say, I don't want this, that's good because you've learned something from that book that you weren't enjoying.